Good evening. Welcome to our second night of the 2024 Campaign for Christ. We're pleased to have with us this week Brother Keith Kassarjian. Uh, we enjoyed the lesson last night. Look forward to the one tonight. Uh, amazing Grace. As a preacher, usually we ask at a funeral, do you have a scripture or a song? It's usually... Uh, if they have one specifically, most of the time it's the 23rd Psalm and Amazing Grace. How wonderful it is. We are having some technical difficulties this evening. We're not ignorant of Satan's devices. Part of those may very well be the electronics here, but uh, Brother John Duty will lead us in our opening prayer. Brother Ronnie Lindbull will lead us in our closing prayer this evening. The order of service is pretty much the way it was last night. We'll have two songs of prayer, another song, Brother Keith, uh, and then we'll have a few announcements at the last. But uh, one thing that was given to me right before we started, which many of you may be aware of, but Deanna Workman's daughter, Amy, who's 11 years old, had a wreck yesterday on a four-wheeler and broke her back and spinal cord. She was flown out to Cincinnati this afternoon. So uh, again, we want to remember her and the family in our prayers. Back at the back of the building, out into the hall to the right is the restrooms. If you're not familiar uh, with the building, in the back of the auditorium, there are various DVDs that are available. And I thought tonight, since we're talking about Amazing Grace, we have a DVD back there that's God's plan for saving mankind that goes along with that. And so uh, avail yourself to that. If you have a friend or someone who wasn't able to be here tonight, then uh, you can share the DVD uh, and make use of those however you can for the kingdom. One other thing is the cards that are in the back. I've got questions about how do we get the videos. If you pick up one of these cards and scan the QR code uh, with your phone or your iPad or whatever, you'll be able to go directly to the page where they're being stored uh, along with various other things. We have uh, our website here, which is www.thechurchesofchrist.life, L-I-F-E. And we have about, uh, the website has about 20 different pages, and we have some resources. There are some correspondence courses that you can sign up for through the Gospel Broadcasting Network, uh, <clears throat> World Bible School. Uh, there is a resource page which has access to all types of study material, and so uh, I use it for my sermons. I, I created the page so I didn't have to have anything other than my iPhone to do a sermon with, so. Again, make uh, that available. Brother Tracy is going to lead us in our singing tonight. So if there's nothing else, Brother Tracy. Oh 
new to some of you, but I think you'll get the hang of it as we go through. Okay. It should be familiar <coughs> to some degree. <coughs> I'm the fount of every blessing in my heart. this evening that 
the little daughter had the accident that you will, your healing power will be great upon her, that she may be able to walk again and be able to do the things that is needful in her life. And Father, we pray for Brother Scott Cabell, that your blessings may be upon him, Father, and encourage him and encourage the families, Father, as we go as they go through these great trials and tribulations. We pray, Father, this evening that if there is those in this audience that has not accepted thee on the terms of the gospel, that this would be the very night that thy word will touch their heart and will break down that stony wall that is between them and salvation. We pray, Heavenly Father, that as we continue through this, we thank you for your love and for the gift of our of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And may we always realize that it is in him that we have the hope of eternal salvation after this life is over. We ask now that you be with us as we continue. Bless our songs as we, as we mingle our voices together, that we may sing praises unto thee. In Christ's precious name and we pray. And amen. 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 Let's all stand and sing, I'll live in glory, before we have our lesson tonight. <clears throat> Everybody take a deep breath. I like to stay here longer than man's allotted days And watch the fleeting changes of a life's uneven ways But if my Savior calls me, he lets me home on high I'll live with him forever in glory by and by Oh yes, I'll live in glory by So I'm going to do that now. I enjoyed being with you last night. Uh, I told my wife, she asked how things had gone. Are we, we working? Is this, this is not working either? Is this one working? I'm just going to have to yell at you, I guess. <laughs> Okay, this is on. I was kind of hoping this one would. 
I, uh, okay, this is not it. It's good to have these modern technological advances as it makes things so much easier and better. Anyway, as I was saying, my wife asked last night, we talked on the phone, how things go. I said, man, I really, really enjoyed being with them. They're such a, a good audience and so engaged in listening, and I enjoyed being with you last night. And uh, I'm happy that you're back again today. Hope you've had a great day. I have, and it's a beautiful day. And, um, and I'm thankful that we get another opportunity to be together and, uh, and think about some things that are really, really important. John Newton lived a pretty rough life for the majority of his life. He was born to, to parents. His father was a, 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 a mariner. His mother died when he was seven years old. Uh, and without the, the steady influence of his mother, uh, he, he went into a life that really wasn't where he needed to go. He'd had some religious training early in life, but he'd forgotten that. He went off and became a merchant marine when he was before he was even a teenager, can you imagine? Uh, by the time he was 18, he was in the, the British Navy. But at one point, he tried to uh, defect from the, uh, the Navy, and so to get rid of him, they put him on a ship, a, a slave ship, that was passing nearby. They got rid of him and put him on that ship. And it was when he was on that slave ship that he learned the slave trade. He would become very big in slave trade. According to his own words, it was a very profitable business. But you can imagine all of the ungodly, not only the practice itself being ungodly, but the ungodly treatment of people. And so... That was the way he lived until finally one day he began to have some, some thoughts about spiritual matters and decided he needed to change his life. He actually became a minister. And it was one day while he was contemplating how, how ungodly he had been and yet how good God was to him. And he wrote those famous words, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Have you ever felt the same way? I hope that you still are amazed by God's grace. It is indeed amazing. And that amazing grace is going to be our focus this evening. Are there some things that you're amazed by? There's some things that, uh, that I think are amazing. Uh, the Olympics has just recently concluded. And I watched some of those things. Some of those activities I've actually, you know, to some extent been involved in. And so when you see the best in the world do them, you're amazed. I've run a few marathons, and there was a, the winner of the marathon race won it in a time that was just, you can't even, once you've done a few, you can't even comprehend how anybody can do that. It's amazing. I saw some activities that I've never even attempted because I never could, and I was still amazed by that. Perhaps you've been to some place in the world uh, where the natural beauty or something that, that was going on there was just amazing, and you just stood there in awe. Or maybe accomplishments of people. I, I'm amazed by people who can just quote books of the Bible. What is it that you are amazed by? Well, I hope that there is nothing that you are more amazed by than the grace of God. And we should never lose our wonder and our amazement by how good God is. You think of all the gifts that God showers on us every day, just, you know, life and breath and, and all of the good things that we enjoy, all of the blessings that we have. But of all of those, even they pale in comparison to the grace of God. It is indeed the most amazing gift God has given us. I invite you to turn your Bible to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. 
Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus, and he, and he gives them a before and after picture. And he says, starting in, in Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 1, he says, You were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them too, we all formerly lived in the, flush, the, the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest, he says. It was a bad picture. He says, that's how you used to be. You ever see these before and after pictures? This is the before picture. You were dead, you were sinful, you were lost. But notice what he says in verse 4. The first two words of verse 4 change everything. But God. But God. That's how you used to be, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus in order that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us. How? In Christ Jesus. How did God show us kindness? By the grace that he gave in Jesus Christ. Verse 8, he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast. God knows human nature, and if there was even the slightest hint or possibility that we did it ourselves, we'd take credit for it. But grace is completely not of our own doing. And we don't earn it, and we don't deserve it. Therefore, he says in verse 10, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God doesn't owe us salvation. For that matter, God doesn't owe us anything, does he? But when he extends this grace to us, it is indeed amazing. This evening, I want us to think about four reasons why God's grace is amazing. God's grace really is amazing, and I want us to be reminded. You may not learn anything new. I don't know. Maybe you will. Maybe you won't. But if, even if we don't, I want us to be reminded of how great and how amazing God's grace is. Four reasons why grace is amazing. Number one, grace is amazing because it cost heaven so much to make it available. Now we all are pretty cost conscious, aren't we? I mean, we have to be aware of, of the cost of certain things. Have y'all had a hot summer, like hotter than normal summer? I live in central Alabama and, and it obviously it gets hot there, hotter than it is here, uh, but it doesn't usually get as hot in June as it did this June. I mean, just really, really hot. And, and do you know what came in the mail in July? The power bill. <laughs> Woo! The power bill isn't normally a topic of conversation at my house, but that month it was. And when we saw the number in that bill, I went around turning everything off. <laughs> We're cost conscious and we, we have to be. And, and we see you know, gas there is, is $329, but over there is $325. I'm going to go there because we're cost conscious. But have you ever considered how much grace costs God? It isn't free to provide. To make grace available, it really did cost heaven a lot. To begin with, you think about God the Father and what it cost him. That great verse, John 3, 16, don't be so familiar with it that you are not still amazed by what it says. God so loved you. 
that He gave His only begotten Son. Can you imagine? I have three children, I have two grandchildren, and I would not give any of them for you. I suspect you feel the same way as well. And yet God the Father was willing to sacrifice His own Son to be the, the, that sacrificial Lamb. As, as we read in John chapter 1, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Father was willing to do that. You think about what it cost Jesus. The, 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 to think about what he had to give up. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9 says, You know the grace of our Lord that though he was rich, yet for your sakes became poor, that through his poverty you may be rich. He left the glory and the comfort and the splendor of heaven to come here. Let me put it this way. He came from where we want to go to be where we are. Why would he do that? Because he loved us that much. And we must never forget the high price of grace. Yes, it's free for us to receive, but it wasn't free to provide. And you know, we can we can Take it for granted. We can stop being amazed by grace. But don't let that happen. You know, one of the challenges for those of us who have been in the church for a long time and, and have really not ever not known what it's like to know about grace. I was, I was for example, I was born on a Sunday and I was in church the next Sunday, literally. I do not ever remember a time, there's never been a time in my life I didn't know about grace. And you know, it's easier for people like me to forget how amazing it is. You can get used to it. Today, I, I worked all day in my room, worked at the desk, worked all day long. And finally, when I was finished, I went down to get some exercise. And when I was coming back, I noticed that in the hotel lobby, they had coffee. And I don't usually drink, I drink coffee in the morning, but not usually in the afternoon, but this was free, and that's my favorite price. And so I got a cup of coffee, and I took it back to my room. This was about 5 o'clock. Took it back to my room, and I drank that cup of coffee. And do you know what I did within minutes of finishing that cup of coffee? I dozed off. <laughs> Luckily, I woke up in time to be here. But can you imagine you drink a cup of coffee, and then you fall asleep? What that means is... I'm so used to the caffeine, it really doesn't... Now, if you didn't normally drink coffee and you had that cup of coffee, you'd be wired, right? But I'm used to it. And it's okay to be used to caffeine. It's not okay to be used to grace. We need to be constantly amazed by that. You think about what Jesus gave up. In Philippians chapter 2, uh, verses 5 through 11, Paul points us toward the attitude of Christ that that we should have the same attitude that Jesus had. And illustrating that attitude, he says that he was willing to leave heaven. And that he did not even consider being considered God to be something that was, he had to have. And that he was willing to humble himself even, not only to death, but death on a cross. It cost heaven so much. Some workers were blasting a quarry and they had set the next charge to go off. The wires were run, the charge was set, the men had retreated to safety when suddenly to their horror they saw a three-year-old boy from seemingly nowhere begin walking across the very area where the blasting was going to occur. The men were afraid. They, they began waving their arms and yelling at the boy, but they were afraid to actually run to him. The little boy saw them, but he was just amused by their antics and he didn't do anything different. But the, mother, the boy's mother saw him and she showed up. and She didn't run to him and she didn't yell to him. Instead, she knelt down. She opened her arms up and he ran to the safety of her arms. And he was safe. 
I think that's a pretty good description of what Jesus did for us. He has opened his arms on the cross, literally, and figuratively opened those arms, and he kneels down and he awaits for us to come. No forcing, no yelling, but the arms are open, and he awaits for us, and he invites us to enjoy the safety that is found in him. What a picture of God's grace. And you know, one of the, the amazing things about what God was willing to do to make it possible is that he did this not for the best of the best. Right? I mean, you know, Scripture says it's possible that a, a good, uh, that somebody might be willing to die for a good person. It's possible. Probably won't happen, but it's possible. But that's not what happened in this case. Romans 5 and verse 8 says, While we were yet, what? Sinners. Jesus died for us. Have you ever considered that Jesus, in his infinite wisdom, died for, knowing what was going to happen, he died for the people who would kill him. He died for them just as much as he did for you and I. That is amazing. It is amazing. We must never stop being amazed by God's grace. Grace is amazing because it cost heaven so much to make it available. But secondly, I think it is also amazing because grace is so plainly taught and yet it is so widely misunderstood. I'm not sure that there is a Bible subject that is more widely misunderstood than the subject of grace. And at the same time, I don't actually know of a Bible subject that's more plainly taught and actually simple to understand. So, obviously, we cannot earn our salvation. We know that. But does that mean that mankind doesn't have to do anything to receive and enjoy God's grace? And that's where we find some, some contradictions in teachings because there are those who say well you know really all you really need to do is believe because you can't earn it you can't do anything and, and if you teach that you have to do something then that means you're saying you're being saved by works and the Bible says we're not saved by works and then those of us who say well the Bible says that you need to repent and be baptized you know that no that's that's a work by the way by definition belief is a work too I haven't found anybody who says that's not necessary. So what, what are we to make out of that? How is it that we should see these things? Well, there's, there, there are two uh, important points to consider. First of all is the fact that Jesus died for everyone. There isn't a single person on this planet that he didn't die for. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 make it very plain he died for everybody. 1 Peter 3 and verse 9 says that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so there is this fact that Jesus died for everybody. By the way, that's a good reminder for us, isn't it? That person that is different than you, who acts in a certain way, who looks a different way, who you are frustrated with or you find it difficult to be nice to, Jesus died for them. You'll never look into the eyes of a, of a person that Jesus didn't die for. That'll temper our behavior some on it. Jesus died for everybody. And there's this other fact that Jesus himself stated in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, where he says not everybody is going to be saved. He says, you might remember, there's a wide gate, a, a, a broad way and a wide gate that leads to destruction, and there will be many who go there. He says there's this narrow way and a, a narrow gate, and there will be very few who go there. Jesus himself said, not most will be saved. So what are we to make out of these two seemingly contradictory points? Jesus died for everybody. And yet Jesus said not everybody, in fact not most, 
are going to be saved. How, how are we to understand that? Well, the biblical way to understand that is that there is something that must be done to receive the grace that God made possible. And that is what we would call our obedience. And this is not new to grace. If you look throughout Scripture, you find example after example where God was willing to do something for someone or some group of people as long as they obeyed and did what he said. I think about the ark. You know, Noah had to do everything that God told him to do in the way he told him to do it in order to be saved. And then he actually had to get in the ark to be saved. And anybody who was in it was saved. And anybody who was out of it wasn't saved. And nobody deserved that. If you will, that was grace too. But something had to be done. I think about uh, walking around the, the wall of Jericho. There was nothing magical about walking around that wall that made it fall. There was nothing magical about shouting that made it fall. It fell when they did exactly what God told them to do. And so this isn't new in God's dealings with mankind. God has often made something available that could not be earned or, or even deserved. And it was there to be received when they did what he said. And so now we move into thinking about the salvation of our soul and why should we think that it's different then? Is there such a thing as an unconditional gift? Is there such a thing as an unconditional gift? I don't believe there is, actually. You think about it. Every gift, even if we didn't deserve it, we have to do something to enjoy it, don't we? We have to do something to receive it. For example, I have a $5 bill here. $5 bill. Anybody that wants to come get this $5 bill from me can have it. I mean, seriously, I'm not, I'm not toying with you. Okay, we have one taker right here. Look at here. <laughs> but, but, but wait a minute. Can he have this without doing something? You want to stand here with me? Yeah. So, he, he, he wants this. He, he doesn't deserve it, right? But, I mean, he did leave singing, but I don't think that's a $5 paying job. So, he, he didn't deserve this, but it's being offered. But to enjoy it, what does he have to do? He has to, and, and I can't, and even if I shove it in his pocket, he still has to reach in to get that out. And then he still has to go and do something with it to enjoy it. See, there's not really anything, there's not really an unconditional gift. But if he's willing to, de to take it, it's his. You see what I'm saying? No, it's really interesting. No, I take your money back. <laughs> I got a $5 rebate. <laughs> do you get the point? There really isn't. Even if we think about a birthday gift or a, I give you a, a gift card, you have to take it. You have to use it. You have to. So you're not going to enjoy the benefit of it if you don't. In reality, there isn't any such thing as an unconditional gift. Grace is a gift. We don't deserve it. We can't earn it. It is beyond any of that. But that doesn't mean that we don't have to do something about it. Now, if you have been taught by someone that just believe and, and that's all you need to do, you don't need to do anything else, and we, we don't blame you for what someone taught you. But we also want you to know the truth about what the Bible says. And the Bible says that grace is amazing and it's a gift, but it requires obedience to receive the blessings of it. The Bible tells us when we repent of our sins and we're baptized for the forgiveness of those sins, then at that point, we contact the blood of Christ, we contact the grace of God, and then we receive that salvation that grace provides. I might say it this way, God's part is grace, and man's part is obedient faith. And when those two come together, then the intention and the purpose for grace in our life has been received. And it has been, 
to, has been has taken place in our life. It's so simple. It really is that simple. Let's not forget how simple it is, and yet how profound and amazing the grace of God is. A third reason I believe that grace is amazing is because it gives us the opposite of what we really deserve. It gives us the opposite of what we deserve. You know, we, we like it when something bad happens to somebody who did something bad, don't we? We call it poetic justice. A uh, guy goes in to rob a bank, and in the process, he gets shot, and he dies. And our first thought is what? He got what he deserved. And you know, we like that because there's some part of our uh, makeup that appreciates justice. Except when I'm the one who is set to receive justice, in which case I'm not really all that interested in justice. And grace gives us what we don't deserve. And that's even bigger than not giving us what we do deserve. We'll get to that in a minute. But in Romans chapter 6 and verse 3, the Bible, or verse 23, Romans 6, 23, the Bible tells us what we deserve. The wages of sin is death. And prior to that, in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, also 3 and 10, we find that that's, that includes everybody. Not one is perfect. No, not one. And you know, even if you have only sinned once in your life. Now, anybody here want to claim they've only sinned once in their life? We, we might do that before we get out of bed in the morning, right? Even if you only sinned once, there's still sin. And if it's not taken care of, the wages of sin is death. That's what we all deserve. It's amazing to consider that when we deserve death, grace gives us life. And when we deserve punishment, God offers pardon. When we deserve justice, God gives us grace. I think the Apostle Peter is a really good example of what this looked like in one particular occasion. You, you might remember uh, the time that Peter and the other apostles were with Jesus, and, and Jesus said, one of you is going to deny me. And Peter said, oh, no, I, I would never do that. In fact, I would die for you. You remember him saying that. And Jesus said, actually, Peter, you're actually going to deny me three times. And, oh, no, no, I would never do that. And, and you remember how it played out on that particular night. G Peter denied Jesus not once, not twice, but as predicted three times. And you remember the, the rooster crowed, and Peter suddenly remembered what, what he had heard would do and just suddenly realized what he had done. The Bible says he wept bitterly. He left completely destroyed and devastated by his own actions. Maybe you've been in a similar situation where it just hits you what you have done. And he was devastated. We fast forward a little bit after the resurrection now. And the Bible tells us, this is in John 20, 21. The Bible tells us that Peter was going fishing. Now, you may remember that before he became an apostle, Peter was a fisherman. I don't, don't imagine he just stopped fishing altogether when he became an apostle, but he stopped doing that uh, as his primary occupation. I think, in this case, Peter has given up on himself, and he's going to go back. I don't think he was going fishing like I do. I think he was going back to his old occupation because he's no longer good enough, and he's blown it. And if Jesus can't count on me, I'm not sure I can serve him. And he goes back to fishing. But Jesus goes to where he is. You might remember they were fishing. This is the occasion where he says, cast your net on the other side of the boat. 
and then they make him bre he makes the breakfast and then he and Peter have a conversation and this is where Jesus asks him three times do you love me I think it's three the three times is intentional how many times did, did Peter deny Jesus three times and Jesus gave him an opportunity to affirm his love for him not once not twice but three times Jesus didn't give up on him and you know it wasn't many days later Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost the first sermon of the day the church began that's grace he didn't deserve it but that's what grace offers and maybe you're sitting here tonight and you feel like Peter did and maybe you've given up on yourself and you think God's given up on you it's not true it isn't true because grace gives us the opposite of what we deserve there are three key words that we need to consider the first word is justice justice is when we get what we deserve I commit this particular crime I'm guilty of it and I am sentenced with a penalty for that crime that's what I deserve that's what I got that's justice there's a second word to consider and that is the word mercy mercy can be defined like this this is when we don't get what we deserve I committed the crime I could have been sentenced to 30 years but the judge reduced it to five years I'm punished but I didn't get what I deserved and then we come to this word grace and grace is when we get what we don't deserve I committed the crime not only do I deserve the punishment because I'm guilty the judge says we're just going to throw that out you're free to go justice mercy and grace we don't deserve grace we deserve justice in fact, we're begging for a little bit of mercy, but mercy's not really going to help us in the day of judgment, is it? What we need and what we stand in need of is the amazing grace of God that will not only not give us justice, but will give us what we don't deserve, and that is eternal life because we have been forgiven of our sins because we're in Christ. That's what we need. And that's what God's amazing grace does. It's interesting to me that Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote about grace more than any other writer. And I think it's noteworthy because we know what his life used to be like. Prior to becoming a Christian, he was the most, perhaps the most anti-Christian person in all of Palestine. He was involved in watching the first martyr, Stephen, be killed. Can you imagine just watching people throw rocks at a person until... The, his body is so battered and broken that he dies. Saul was there watching. Saul was on his way to persecute more Christians when that light happened on the day that he was converted. And now he finds himself an apostle. Not only is he not being held responsible for all of those sins, he has been forgiven and he has been placed in the kingdom of God and in God's family. And he is now preaching the gospel and telling others about the same grace that he had experienced. And he never forgot, as we would say sometimes, he never forgot where he came from. You might remember him even saying of himself, I am the chief of sinners. He never forgot that. Because what that did was keep him reminded of the grace of God. And I, I doubt that any of you have ever done some of the bad things that he did. So maybe we've not been so impressed by grace, but we ought to be. We ought to be. Because it gives us the opposite of what we deserve. It gives us what we need, not what we deserve. God's amazing grace. One more thing to think about. 
And that is that grace is amazing because it offers so much in exchange for so little. Now, we are not suggesting that obeying God and giving our life to Him and being committed to Him is always easy. We're not suggesting that there's no price to be paid. In fact, quite the opposite. There is a high price, and He does call for commitment. But have you ever considered that even though that is a significant commitment on our part, what we receive in exchange is so much greater? It really is. You think about how to even compare. Think about the fact that the, the effort, for example, think about the effort involved in coming to Christ, and there is effort involved, but think about the rest and the peace that he gives us in return. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, Jesus said, are you, are you weary? Are you heavy laden? Come, and I will give you rest. Consider the effort of faith with the peace of God that faith provides. Romans 5 and verse 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What we get in return is always so much more than we give. Consider the effort of repentance, and repentance takes a lot of effort, takes a lot of commitment. For some, it is an ongoing process, but, and so it requires effort. But think about the escape from danger that it provides. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We escape that in our repentance. Think about the effort involved in confessing Jesus with the joy of one day hearing him confess you to his father. Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33. Think about the effort involved in being baptized, which we can do tonight, with all of the spiritual blessings that come as a result, that the sins are washed away, we're now added to his family, we get to, to live in the family of God. Live in the light of forgiveness and grace. Consider how much more it gives than we could ever give. Think about the effort of Christian living, and it is, but consider that as opposed to the crown of righteousness that will be given to us one day, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. You see, grace is amazing because it offers so much in exchange for so little. And this evening, I wonder if you are in need of God's grace. If you are, he stands ready to give it. It's offered. The price has already been paid. If you've never been baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, you can do that tonight. Uh, and, and if you have questions about that, or what that really means, what that uh, requires, then there are a lot of folks around here who would be happy to study that with you, to talk about it. If that's something you're thinking about, something you're considering, we want to help you to receive and to enjoy the amazing grace of God. And let us know how we can help you. Maybe you are in Christ, but you've forgotten how amazing it is. For those of us who've been in Christ for some time, we have to keep reminding ourselves, can't we? Don't we? In fact, the song Amazing Grace... I can sing that song without ever thinking about grace. How about you? I know it so well. I've sung it so many times. I can sing Amazing Grace and be thinking about something else. And the danger of forgetting is that we lose sight of what's really important. And maybe that's happened to you and you can see that you're shifting and you're, you're drifting. Tonight, come back. Come back to the grace of God. And by the way, His grace forgives you. His grace gives you what you don't deserve, which is complete forgiveness. If you have a need tonight that we can help you with, please let us know how we can help right now while we stand and sing.
Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you worry for a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. this evening, and so if you would, please, uh, we would like to also ask that you keep Brother Brandon, Sister Hannah, and their family uh, in your prayers, as well as, again, Amy Workman. Uh, as we finish up here this evening, uh, if you are new to this area and, and are not really familiar with the traffic pattern, uh, we would encourage you to be very careful pulling out onto the highway. Uh, we do have, uh, hopefully, a police officer there trying to slow the traffic down, but especially if you're trying to make a left-hand turn back on uh, to the quarter, we, we really encourage you to be careful. And also, as you're making a right back to Allen Creek, because those cars can come up behind you pretty fast. Does anyone have anything else that needs to be brought up at this time? Brother Ron. I heard coming down to the meeting tonight that the little girl had come out of the uh, operating room and she's doing fine. They've got everything knitted back together. So let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for all the blessings that you give us in this life. Father, thank you for our family that we love so much. And also, we thank, we thank you for the family of God that we can come and worship thee with you. With you. 
And Father, we pray that they be one here tonight that's not a member of the body of Christ. We pray, Father, that they will realize the condition that they're in, that they will obey the gospel before it's everlasting too late. Pray for our brothers or sisters that are home, that are sick, that, that are in bed fast. Pray for them that they would like to come to the meeting, but they can't. We pray, Father, that they'll get it with them. And as we go down through this uneven journey of life, many things is going to cross our paths. They'll get us down. Don't ever give up on God. Fight for the last minute. And Father, as we come to the end of our life, we pray that you'll give us a home in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.